Well, welcome to another Light Blade Burning Lab. Today we're going to tackle something completely different. We're going to go back into the mechanics of the machine and we're going to do a little bit of setting. The item that we're going to look at is the autofocus sensor switch, otherwise known as a pen. Now I'm afraid you're going to have to put up with another one of my very high-tech drawings. The lenses sit at different points above the work surface, which is here. The lenses in this particular machine always produce the focal point at approximately the same position. The idea is that the beam focuses down from any one of these lenses, this being a two inch, this being a two and a half inch, and this being the four inch, they all focus down to this one point, which is approximately seven millimeters below the nozzle itself. I say approximately because you cannot guarantee that to within better than probably half a millimeter, even when you change the lenses. If all the lenses were perfect, then once you've set the autofocus system up, you would never have to touch it again. It would always set this seven millimeter dimension here. Built into the RD Works software in the vendor settings for this machine, there is something called a five millimeter offset from Z0. What we've got here at the side is a switch. And I'll draw it like this. The five millimeters that I'm talking about is relative to this work surface. The table will move up, it detects the switch at that position there and calls it Z0. Then it goes into its software and it moves the table down by five millimeters and resets that to zero. So this table position <clears throat> is now Z equals zero and it's seven millimeters below the work surface. Now the problem is because the lenses might not have exactly the same focal point as you change the lenses, what we'll have to do is to be able to set this switch to suit the lens in question. So as you change the lens over, we shall have to change the switch position to give us whatever this dimension is. It could be 7.5 dimension. It could be 6.5. We'll have to wait and see. OK, well, let's dive in and get started, should we? OK, now, before we start looking at how we set this pen relative to the nozzle, I'm going to be a bit rude and say that I am not very much in love with this piece of engineering here. It's aluminium. It's very, very fragile. I've actually got thumb screws in here as opposed to the cap head screws that were in there originally because you've only got to put the smallest amount of pressure on there with an allen key and you'll strip the thread. I've always used these two thumb screw things. They're not all that steady. Look, they you can still wobble it. You can't you can't put enough pressure on it to clamp this really securely. So before I show you how to set this up I'm going to make a radical change to this design and we're going to replace this with my own design. Before you even start to think about setting up this system, the one thing you must know is what the gap is we're supposed to have between here and here. Now for most of these lenses it's around about seven millimeters. It would be a wonderful dream if all the lenses were set to exactly the same focal point so that you only had to have a set this once and then after that you could just rely on the autofocus to set the correct focal point for whatever lens it is that you're using. If we look in here we shall see that the lens is set quite a long way back down that tube and that's because it's a two and a half inch focal length lens. Now what's in here at the moment is a two inch lens and the lens will be much closer to the front of this tube. There's also a four inch lens which sits right back here. So the lens will go up and down according to its focal length, but the focal point will always remain approximately seven millimeters below this nozzle. Now, even if you change from one two inch lens 
to another two inch lens, I would advise you to check the focal distance because not all lenses are exactly the same. One might be a plano convex lens and the other might be a meniscus lens, for example. Whenever you change the lens in your system here, in the tube, and from time to time you'll need to change that lens in there, um, it's always worth carrying out the focus check. The irony of this situation is that before we can do any calibration on here, we have to have something to reference it against. And so what I've got here are some little step gauges. This one runs in steps of one millimeter between one and 20 millimeters. And this one has got an extra half a millimeter added to the bottom of it. So it runs from one and a half millimeters to 20 and a half millimeters. So with these two gauges, we can set any gap between work and nozzle to within half a millimeter, which will be good enough. Now the lens I've got in here at the moment is two inch lens. For each one of my lenses, I have already worked out what the gap is between here and the workpiece. And they're not all the same. For this two inch lens, it's seven millimeters. So the first thing we're going to do is to set this gap here to seven millimeters. We'll just undo that and we'll lift the nozzle up as high as we can get it. We'll raise the table. When we're raising the table, you can't really take the surface of this table any higher than the surface of the frame. Otherwise it'll hit the micro switch. Okay, so we're now going to cut our piece of acrylic and make a new bracket that goes on here. The top surface that we're going to see is perfectly clean. Now, these little nicks in here are to make it easier for me to locate when I drill screw holes. I've only got to locate the drill across the work, approximately in the centre, because the drill will automatically focus onto the V and hold it the correct position relative to the centre line of the hole. So first of all I've got to set my piece of acrylic up at 45 degrees like that so that my holes run vertically downwards. Now I've already drilled and tapped those holes M4 but what I will do is show you how I went about tapping those by doing the last one. The V will automatically line the drill up this way. All I've got to do is concentrate on getting it approximately in the centre of the V like that. I'm going to remove the belt from the drill spindle so that the chuck is rotating manually because I'm going to do a bit of an engineering cheat and I'm going to use this drill as a hand tap but I'm going to do it so that it holds the tap perfectly in line and tapping my M4 hole in there. Now what I've got is an o-ring. I could have used a small compression spring but I decided that people probably won't have a spring but you certainly might be able to get hold of an o-ring very cheaply and this will do the same job. So what I'm going to do is to snip a piece of that o-ring out about a quarter of an inch long. It's got to be approximately half the distance to this edge here. We're now going to remove this <coughs> Undo this, take it off, remove the pen. Wow. So now we've really upset the settings that were supplied with the machine. So hopefully if I've designed this correctly, that will be quite a nice slide fit in there, which it is. And what we're now going to do is to put the piece of O-ring into the hole that's at the back there, that flat hole. And we'll put it an M4 screw in behind it. We should see the O-ring just start to come through the hole there. And what we're trying to do is to get this so that it is, when you tighten that screw up, you can still move it 
like this. It's clamped, but not clamped. It's clamped, but still able to slide around like that. Okay, so what we've done, we've actually put a small compression system in there that allows you to adjust this very accurately and it will stay put. And then through here, we can now put a cap edge screw because A, we've got a lot of material here and B, we don't need much clamping load. And we should do the same in there. We'll put a cap edge screw in there. We've only got one clamp screw in here this time instead of two. And that's because basically what we've got here is a V-block. I've changed the design so that it's located here and here and clamped just there. So now when I slip that on and put that back in there, like that, I shall be able to clamp that up and feel it snuggle up like that. Put just a small amount of load on it and that will be really a nice stiff positive fixing for this. But bear in mind that this we can still move it around. You could go back and look at session 10 to find out how you would find the exact focus for this nozzle. It, it really doesn't matter where you do your location and reference from and we're going to set it off a block. We could set it off this surface but it might be too low. So the first thing we've got to do is we've got to raise the table so that we've got approximately seven millimeters under here. Well in this particular instance I know it's exactly seven millimeters. Ten, nine, eight, seven is there. I'm going to drop that down onto the gauge like that. Hands off just so that there's no pressure on anything and then I'm clamping it up. So that's my seven millimeter position. This has to be switching exactly five millimeters above the same work surface. And hey look I've got a five millimeter gauge here and I can now adjust this up and down until it just touches the step. But that's not going to help me. So now we'll come across to the keyboard and we'll press the ZU button and we've got to use the arrow keys to go right the way down to the bottom and down this list as well until we find uh, diagnosis. Enter. And in diagnosis we shall find that we've got a series of basically indicator switches and just here we've got Z plus and Z minus. So if we now tweak very carefully the limit switch, the pen, what we should find is that at a certain point it will change. Pull it up and just gently put it down again until you make the switch go red. And there we go. Okay, so now we can tighten this one up and we can feel it now snuggled up. And what we can do is test it. We will just exit, escape from this screen and we get back to this screen here where we can press the up arrow until we get to autofocus. Now I purposely moved the block out of the way just in case there's any risk of something going wrong. Better safe than sorry. So if we press autofocus, enter. And then it drops away five millimeters, which is why we used that five millimeter step. And now, if it's all worked properly, we should find that we've got a seven millimeter gap underneath there. Just like that, look, absolutely perfect. Seven millimeters. If all of a sudden I decide I want to do something, I want to clean my lens, for example, so I need to take my lens out. Well, rather than take everything out, we leave that behind. We shall often need to take that off to clean the end of the 
the actual nozzle itself to keep that nice and clear because that's an if you like something that people tend to overlook now we've done that we put this back on and the first thing we do is push everything right to the top push everything right to the top and tighten it up again we're guaranteed that our clamp is sitting down on this shoulder which is most important okay and from now onwards we've got the autofocus set it doesn't matter that we've had it off and put it back on again because this point switch point here relative to that shoulder has not changed we've got lots of space down below now we've turned the block over and let's just do another autofocus run to the bottom of the list autofocus enter So we'll just use the real world to check again. Five, six, seven. It won't go on at eight, and it's just a lovely slide fit under seven. So that switch is set absolutely perfectly. Now you need to do the same thing for every lens that you've got in your system. Check where its true focus point is, and come back and do this same procedure. Now if you didn't make these the first time round, and these are made out of 5mm material just so that they stand on their edge and are self-supporting. If you find that they're not exactly the dimensions that are shown on here, either you can tweak them yourself or leave them as they are. Because you're not interested in real world dimensions, what you're interested in is the numbers that are on these here. So, for instance, I don't know whether that dimension that I've just set there is exactly 7mm. It may be 7.3. It doesn't matter because whenever I set it up, I'm using this gauge. Some very observant person is going to say, yeah, but look, I've got a screw here. If I undo that screw, I can adjust the micro switch from up here. Yes, you can do, but it's a lot more fiddly and you don't have the same precision control that you do down here with my friction system that I've introduced. This will be very much more difficult to actually set. So I would advise you not to touch this one and just do your settings down here with this one screw. Now, I'm personally not a lover of the autofocus system because it gets in the way of me messing around with the machine far too much. And I'm going to give you an example of that now. Look, we've just set this up to etch, for example, on this surface. Fantastic. If I want to raise the job and I go to ZU and I try and raise the job, I can't. I can lower it but I can't raise it. It'll only come up to zero, which is the auto-focused position. So all it will ever do now is come back and set to seven millimeters, i.e. zero Z. So if I want to, for instance, engra engrave something on there, what I've got to do is I've got to go all the way through to ZU and down to auto-focus again which is fine but I now want to set up for another job and I want the table up how do I get the table up because it's already at zero so when you start the machine up, or when you press reset, it automatically cancels your auto zero. And now you've got full control of Z. 
and that's how I tend to operate the machine because if all of a sudden I want to bring for instance that surface into play Z U button raise the job up I just drop my gauge under there with the 7 mil step let that drop down onto it job done the only reason I could see you'd want an autofocus system is if you wanted to do some sort of in-process change of height. Now I don't know what that in-process change of height would be. I've not discovered anything in the work that I've been doing over the past two years where you have to change the focus height during the process. There is a myth going round that if you want to cut thick material you should drop your focus point to something like about a third of the way into the material. Well, all the experimentation work I've done shows that I don't get any advantage. I leave my focus point set always on the surface of the job and just adjust the speed to get the cut right. Now, although I'm not a convert to this system, I'm very happy to make it stable and to show you guys how to set it up. If you have a real need for it within your process, then fine. In theory, this is a good idea. In practice, it's about as useful as this other thing that I have strapped up. This is the red dot pointer. So when you're not looking, I shan't be using this autofocus system. I can leave it like this, it's not dangerous like this, and I will be able to set this up in a tenth of the time that it takes for the autofocus system to work. And it gets even worse if I've got a very small product that I want to put on there. For instance, let's just say I want to autofocus on that now. Let's just see what happens. All the way down to autofocus. Press the enter button. Ah, it's now hit the limit stop for the table. And so what it'll do, it'll find its limit position there and then it'll drop down to a safe position, like that. And now I can drop this down until it just about touches the surface and then I can lock it up. And then I've got to go through the whole process again. So we've got to set the ZU button, go down to autofocus and press enter. I've just wasted a minute of my life and at my age I can't afford to do that. Well here we are at the end of this session and I've got to make it very very clear that some of the opinions that I have expressed are very personal opinions. There is no criticism of Think Laser and the product that they are selling. This is a well engineered product and it is in demand by the marketplace. So all that Think Laser are doing is satisfying that demand. It's just that the marketplace doesn't realise that there is very little use for this lovely feature. If you're going to do some acrylic origami work, and I've seen some great stuff online, well I was quite excited at the possibility, but I've never got round to it. The need has never arisen, I haven't got a business that would require it, but maybe you're in a business where you have got that specialist niche that really requires this autofocus system. But I hope today that I've demonstrated that those people that think they need it probably don't really need it. It would be a lot quicker to set the machine up manually. I don't want to take anything away from the quality engineering that's been built into this machine. Well, thank you very much for your time and your patience for listening to the rantings of an old man. Um, I shall see you in the next session.